Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan and today we're going to be continuing our How to Survive series with a bit of a different scenario. So far we've looked at a variety of different battlefields ranging from the swamps of Mimban to the deep oceans of Moncala. For the most part our instructions has been directed to troopers and other ground pounders. Today we're going to instead be giving advice to the Jedi, the force wielding warriors who seem to be constantly surrounded by plot armor and magic, except on one occasion, during Order 66. It's kind of ironic we're doing this video. After all, we've spent more than our fair share of time teaching you guys how to gun down the Jedi properly. But you know us guys, we're always fighting for the underdogs. And who an underdog is can change at the beep of a hollow message. As usual, we'll be splitting this video into four segments. First, we'll be talking about the background of Order 66. Then we'll be talking about the enemy combatants, which will be clones in this scenario. And then we'll be talking about what equipment and training you'll need to survive, including finally, what you actually should do to survive Order 66. So Order 66 has its roots in a sinister plan first concocted by Darth Plagueis, decades before the Clone Wars had even begun. Not only was Plagueis a Sith Lord, he was also a shadowy power broker who ran much of the Outer Rim. He used his massive amount of influence and resources to start the construction of the Clone Army. Unlike previous Sith Lords, Plagueis and Sidious sought a much less confrontational route to taking over the galaxy. Instead of waging war, they decided to use the Galactic Republic's democratic institutions against itself. The charismatic politician Palpatine was able to guide the Republic towards a militaristic authoritarian state thanks to the Separatist Crisis, which was also engineered by the Sith. The Separatists were such a great threat that the Republic, which had been demilitarized for more than a thousand years, quickly accepted the mysterious clone army, which appeared out of nowhere. Palpatine was granted emergency powers and basically never looked back. Now, a key component to Order 66 was a control chip that was inserted into each clone's brain. These chips had a list of 150 commands known as the Contingency Orders for the Grand Army of the Republic. The Sith had hit Order 66 amongst all the other orders to make things look a little less suspicious. Now, most of these orders had to deal with emergency situations where one branch of the government became too powerful. There are actually several directives that were designed to remove Palpatine from power if he was deemed unfit to rule. Only Order 66 actually focused on removing the Jedi who had become generals in the Republic Army. Now, there was definitely some risk with deploying Order 66. Palpatine wanted to ensure that as many Jedi were wiped out as possible, and ideally none escaped and were able to warn other Jedi about what was going on. So throughout the first three years of the War Dooku and Palpatine carefully spread out the Republic forces into the Outer Rim. One beneficial side effect of prolonging the war was that the Jedi were dying on the battlefield left and right faster than the Order could steal babies to replace them. As the Republic continued pursuing Separatist forces deeper into the Outer Rim, the Jedi commanders also became more spread out across the galaxy, making them a lot more vulnerable and easy to kill. Generally, only the most talented Jedi became Jedi Knights, and the best Jedi Knights would be chosen to lead Republic forces. The Jedi Temple on Coruscant was also emptier as a result of the war, with only the High Jedi Council, Jedi Guardians, and Younglings remaining there. Palpatine had the Jedi exactly where he wanted them when he finally goaded the Jedi into attacking him in his own office, which definitely looks a lot like treason to outsiders. The Jedi were trained not to have any emotional attachments or feelings. This also applied to the clones they led into battle. The Jedi with lower emotional intelligence seemed to be perfectly fine with this and saw their clones as nothing more than droids or cannon fodder. Resources to be used in order to achieve an objective. Usually, Jedi who treated their clones this way did not stand a chance of surviving Order 66. Other Jedi treated their clones with respect, but remained distant enough to maintain the proper relationship one would expect to see between a commander and a soldier. Some Jedi, like Anakin Skywalker and his apprentice Ahsoka Tano, however, treated their clones like close family. You see, the clones were basically just normal human beings. Sure, they had all been cloned from the dangerous mercenary Jango Fett, but their DNA had been modified to make them more obedient and loyal to their commanders. But they still had human-like mindsets and emotions. As the war went on and they became more exposed to the wider galaxy, more and more clones developed unique personalities, and no two clones were really the same. 
As individuals, each clone reacted to different situations in different ways, and the clones weren't just loyal to the Republic because of their programming. In many ways, the GAR was the only family they've ever known, and even if they disagreed with the Republic's policies or how they were treating them, they usually wouldn't go betray their own family. The clones were just like normal human beings. When they found out about the control chips in their brains, they were upset and felt like they were being used. Which says a lot about their behavior and their mindset. These weren't just robotic drones that were designed to follow orders. Developing a close relationship with your clones is not only the moral thing to do as a commander, it might even save you from Order 66. Although it should be noted that the control chips in the brains of these clones were quite powerful, and it's unsure how many of these clones would be able to resist its commands. I'm sure like most gadgets, these control chips had a failure rate, and I'm sure a clone that had strong enough of an emotional attachment to their Jedi commander, they might be able to even resist their control chip. The clones were considered the most formidable soldiers ever mass produced. We've actually done several videos on this channel about just how great they were and why they were great. Their template was Jango Fett, who was famous for killing several Jedi with his bare hands, which is quite an amazing feat that requires athletic ability, strength, and a lot of skill and unpredictability. The Jedi, enhanced by their Force powers, could actually perceive all incoming attacks. To trick their senses was not an easy thing to do. On top of their great genetic stock, the clones were trained continuously for nine years to be the best soldiers in the galaxy. This included several theory and history classes, along with constant simulation training and war games. The clones aged twice as fast as normal human beings, and by the time they were nine, they physically were 18 years old. Equipped with blasters, detonators, and plastoid armor, the average clone was not designed for close-range melee fights against the Jedi. But they usually had trust, familiarity, and numbers on their side. The last thing a Jedi will suspect in the middle of a battle is for all of his clones to shoot him in the back. A Jedi purposely relies very little on his or her equipment aside from their lightsaber. Although I'd argue that some basic armor won't hurt. I mean, you can only block so many incoming blasts around before one hits you, right? The type of training a Jedi has is very important. There are many different forms of lightsaber combat, and in this case, Form 3 is amongst the most important. Also known as the Way of the Minoc, Form 3 was a defensive type of lightsaber combat. The user was able to create an impenetrable shell and ward off multiple attackers at the same time. This includes multiple blaster-wielding clones as well. Form 3 was actually very instinctive and natural and took very little skill to master. So it could buy a Jedi even with lower skill some time if the clones immediately start firing on them. The idea is to buy yourself enough time to be able to process what exactly is going on. For a lot of Jedi, the first thought that might run through their head is pure shock, followed by some anger. These kind of emotions can actually get you gunned down because instead of thinking about where you can go to next to escape, you're thinking about what's actually happening to you and being outraged. But if you are a skilled practitioner of Form 3 and that is your fallback instinctual form, it might buy you enough time to snap out of it and run away. Now, obviously, not all Jedi are going to be on foot when Order 66 happens. Some might be piloting a starfighter or a speeder bike. Which brings me to another important skill you might want to learn. Most Jedi have the ability to perceive what's going on in another person's head. This obviously varies from one Jedi to another. Every Jedi has different natural skills and training. Some Jedi can read an individual's thoughts, others can get a general sense of their mood. While this might seem a bit intrusive, it's a good idea for a leader to understand what the mindset and emotions are of the troops they're commanding. The clones rarely complained or showed outward emotion during a battle because they were professionals, but knowing the mental psyche of your troops will help you understand when you're pushing them too hard. This not only makes you a better commander, it will also prepare you for an Order 66-like situation. Some Jedi were constantly scanning the area around them with almost a passive radar-like technique, which would have allowed them to sense that there was something wrong with the clones around them during Order 66. Now, there are very few ways you can actually prepare yourself for something as unexpected as Order 66. Being a skilled Jedi definitely helps, and the few tips we had in our last segment will also give you a better chance of surviving. Now, we'll be focusing on what you should do if you do survive that initial onslaught and manage to get away from the clones. The first thing you'll need to do is put on a disguise and get rid of anything that marks you as a Jedi, whether it be your robes or even your lightsaber. If you're on a more developed world like Coruscant, where there are plenty of security scanners and x-ray machines or stuff like that, it might be a good idea to throw away your lightsaber or at least rearrange it and deconstruct it into smaller pieces so it's not as easy to recognize. 
On a more distant and less populated world like Felucia, with a limited security presence, keeping your lightsaber hidden in your pocket or in a bag might be enough to deter people from finding out that you are a Jedi. Now, your goal should be to move towards the outer edges of civilization. Any territory where the newly created empire can get you is ideal. An alternative would be a city like Coruscant, where billions of undocumented individuals live in the depths of the Undercity. Now, obviously, in the Underworld, in close proximity to other beings, you are more likely to be discovered. It's incredibly hard for individuals who have grown up using the Force to completely wean themselves off of it. I would really recommend that for those who want to survive completely to give up using the Force, even when people can't see you. The idea is to wean yourself off the Force so that you don't accidentally use it in an emergency situation. For a lot of Jedi, this means restraining themselves from acting like a Jedi. You know, saving people from bandits and accidents and so on. If you want to survive, it's probably not a good idea to stick out at all, let alone be a hero. It's going to be a mundane life for sure, without fantastic adventures to the far edges of the galaxy, and for some of you, that might be too tough to actually live through. Generally speaking, if you don't think you can live the same way Obi-Wan Kenobi does for decades in the desert, this whole post-Order 66 Jedi lifestyle might not be for you. The alternatives are either get gunned down by the clones, or God forbid get discovered by Darth Vader and his Inquisitors, or just give yourself up to the dark side. Obviously, being a dark side Inquisitor might really suck, but considering the alternatives, it might be the best option forward. We won't judge. So there you have it, guys. If you are a Jedi, those are some of the options you have uh, when it comes to surviving Order 66. As you can see, there's not really much you can do, but if you do manage to survive that initial onslaught, you do have more options and more places you can visit. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of this awesome series. As usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.